Good evening and welcome to the Jewish Museum. I'm Aviva Weintraub, an associate curator here, and I want to welcome you and our speakers, Rosalie Goldberg and Simon Dove, to this evening's special program on the languages of dance. I had the pleasure of coordinating the Jewish Museum's presentation of the exhibition Sharon Lockhart, Noah Eshkol. Tonight's program is part of Dialogue and Discourse, a series of conversations inspired by our current exhibitions. To set the stage for this evening's program, I'll be giving you a bit of brief background on the exhibition, and then Jens Hoffman, the museum's deputy director for exhibitions and public programs, will introduce our speakers. What you've been seeing, what you were seeing, is part of a film by Sharon Lockhart called Gosho Gaoka from 1998. And I'd like to start out by thanking Sharon for a wonderful experience in general, and in particular regarding tonight for allowing us to show you this film in this context and in this way, as it's generally been screened in a formal cinema setting. Sharon Lockhart is a contemporary artist based in Los Angeles who uses film and photography, often creating large scale installations. Her work generally involves immersion in different communities with whom she interacts, sometimes over a period of years. She studies their daily rhythms and routine movements. With her camera, she choreographs and captures this collaborative experience. In the past, she has worked with a girls basketball team in the suburb of Tokyo, which you saw, farmers in Japan, and iron workers in Maine, among others. Lockhart conceived the exhibition, Sharon Lockhart, Noah Eshkol, as a two-person show, placing her work in dialogue with that of Israeli movement theorist, dance composer, and textile artist, Noah Eshkol. It's an unusual and interesting collaboration, as it involves a living artist and one who is no longer living, as Noah Eshkol died in 2007. Lockhart was introduced to Eshkol's work on a research trip to Israel in 2008. In the 1950s, Eshkol, together with the architect Avraham Wachman, developed the eshkol wachman movement notation system. The system uses a series of slides and numbers to express the spatial relationships between body parts, both in stasis and in motion. Eshkol devoted her time to developing her movement notation system, writing books, and teaching it. In 1954, she founded the Chamber Dance Group. She had a home and studio in Cholon in Israel, not far from Tel Aviv, where she and her dancers would gather each day. In addition to her groundbreaking work in the field of movement, Eshkol was also an accomplished textile artist. She created roughly 500 wall carpets, to use her term, from scraps of fabric. At Eshkol's request, friends and colleagues from across Israel would bring her scraps of fabrics, and uh, she would design the carpets, and her dancers and friends would sew them into these uh, multi-textured artworks. Following Eshkol's death, the Noah Eshkol Foundation for Movement Notation was founded. Some of the original dancers, together with others, continue transcribing her dances and are dedicated to the preservation and dissemination of her practice. They do performances, workshops, lectures, and other projects. Starting in 2008, Lockhart made several extended visits to Israel over the course of three years. She did research in the Eshkol archives and spent a great deal of time with the dancers, many of whom are longtime members of the chamber dance group. Lockhart filmed them performing five dances that had been composed by Eshkol, and Lockhart created the large-scale film installation, which I hope you've seen downstairs, uh, which is the centerpiece of the exhibition. While Eshkol had considered her work in movement and with textiles to be separate practices, Lockhart presents them together for the first time. Also during Lockhart's research in the archives, she came upon seven spherical models designed by Eshkol and Wachman as instruments for teaching the movement notation system. These wire and mesh models illustrate movements of parts of the body, as well as the moving body as a whole. Lockhart photographed the spheres spinning on their axes. These are some installation views of the exhibition, which was conceived and designed by Lockhart. It consists of a large-scale five-channel film installation. 
the series of photographs, materials from Eshkol's archive, and two wall carpets. And if you haven't had a chance to see it before, I hope you will come back and see it. Um, and now to introduce tonight's speakers, it's my pleasure to introduce Jens Hoffman, the Jewish Museum's Deputy Director for Exhibitions and Public Programs. Please welcome Jens Hoffman. Thank you very much, uh, Aviva, and uh, welcome to the Jewish Museum, to our um, evening tonight with uh, Rosalie Goldberg and Simon Dove. It's a particularly um, special situation for me <clears throat> from various reasons. On the one hand, it's my first sort of public appearance here as a deputy director. Um, but more so, it is also that I'm introducing a very dear friend of mine, someone who I've been and I've known for probably about 15 years now, uh, someone I would call a, a, a more than a friend, a mentor, and um, which is Rosalie. Um, and Rosalie and I um, worked together on um, one of her books, which was uh, called uh, Perform. Um, what was the subtitle? performance since the 60s, and I was doing research on it. And the way this sort of happened was that I had actually a background in dance and theater. So this whole subject of uh, tonight's talk and Sharon Lockhart's exhibition are very close to uh, my interest. And I've also worked with uh, Sharon Lockhart on a number of occasions, uh, most recently working with her on uh, commissioning a new series of photographies, photographs that she took in California. Um, just a few more words about um, our speakers tonight. Rosalie Goldberg is the founding director and curator of Performer. Um, she's an art historian, critic, and curator whose book, Performance Art, Futurism to the Present, was first published in 1979 and um, pioneered the studio, uh, study of performance art. She was director of the Royal College of Art Gallery in London and a curator at the Kitchen here in New York. Um, she is also the author of Performance, Life Art Since the 1960s, which is a book that we collaborated on. Uh, that was followed by a monograph on the work of Laurie Anderson. And I know that she's in the moment in the process of, of authoring a number of um, other books um, that we are uh, looking forward to seeing. Um, she's a frequent contributor to Art Forum and other publications. And um, she, um, wait, uh, yeah, in 2004 she founded Performa, which is a non-profit arts organization that is committed to the research, development, presentation of performance by visual artists from all around the world. Um, it was launched in 2005 and has had so far four editions, uh, last one being in 2011. Um, since 1987, Goldberg has also been a professor at uh, New York University. Simon Dove is an independent curator and uh, curator of Crossing the Line, the French Institute's annual festival in New York that is presenting a wide range of interdisciplinary artworks, performances um, from um, <clears throat> a wide pool of artists. For the past five years, he was a director of the School of Dance at the Arizona State University, where he developed a radically new um, way of educating artists for the 21st century. He has an extensive career as an art curator, a festival director, and educator in the United Kingdom, the Netherlands, and now here also in the United States. Please uh, join me in welcoming Rosalie and Simon. Okay, you can see we're both used to theater. I'm directing him, he's directing me. It's the way we work. Um, this is indeed a family affair. I feel since I've been in New York and you guys are all coming back, Claudia's back in New York, Jens is back in New York. Um, this is a great moment and uh, let the excitement begin. Okay, quick question. I always like to see who I'm talking to. Um, any businessmen in the house? Anybody work on Wall Street? God, we need them so badly. I mean, this is, this is the state of the arts in the tr New York. Okay, uh, any uh, artists? Oh, do we have any artists? Raise your hand high so we can see. Okay, um, any writers? We got some writers? Fiction? 
Well, we're all writing fiction, but you know what I mean. Uh, historians, some artists, art historians. Let's see how many art historians. Okay, dancers. I need you standing up on your feet in fifth position. Okay, everybody, dancers up. Who's the dancer in the house? <laughs> One, two. That's it. Any former dancers in the house? I thought there were some former dancers here. Yay! Okay, good. Much better. Now I know what's going on. Okay, so um, this show is, is wonderful. As Jens was saying, we've, we've come at this. It's an exhibition that brings together so many of our interests. And uh, the beauty of uh, performance, too, as far as I'm concerned, is that we are looking at so many different disciplines coming together. What I wanted to look at today specifically was this idea of notation. Um, because, uh, of course, Noah Eshkol starts there. That's how we get to know her from afar. But also how an artist sees notation and how somebody working in visual art really tries to translate things that they do in space um, two-dimensionally or three-dimensionally. Uh, as a former dancer myself, a little bit of confession there, um, I was always interested in this idea of what happens when you are in space, that when you're actually a dancer, you're moving in space. When you're painting, I also did a fine art degree, uh, you're trying to do things on a two-dimensional surface about the world that is three-dimensional. So it's always this back and forth that one's trying to look at. So I thought today we'd begin there. And if I figure this out, what do I do? Hmm. No. Okay, getting there. Okay, so I thought we'd just start with a couple. I wanted to take you into this world of notation, and to specifically the world of notation as conceived by artists, because we're looking at this edge here. That's what this whole relationship in the show downstairs is about, is this relationship between a visual artist and somebody who's working in dance, somebody who's working, um, in a sense, with Sharon Lockhart in film, but it's two-dimensional, but of course she moves in space while she's making a film, and somebody who's working, again, with the body in space, this complete absorption of uh, Noah Eshkel, Anybody who's a dancer knows that your entire existence starts somewhere, somewhere in the middle of your gut, the way you stand, the way you put, um, can convey yourself in space. Um, and so I'm just going to select a couple of my favorite images that take us through. Um, is this okay? Is it going back and forth? A little art direction here. We okay? Um, this is actually a beautiful um, notation, uh, woodcuts made by Lothar Schreier, who was at the Bauhaus in the early 20s, just actually when it opened. Uh, and of course, he was an expressionist. It was the early days of Bauhaus before they got rid of all the expressionists. They decided who needs all this old style expressionism, and they really moved into a much more uh, modern idea of the 20, 20th century, a kind of much more technologically oriented. Um, but these were some very, very, very beautiful um, woodcuts that were made. Actually, this one by his wife. Margaret Trier at, at the Bauhaus. Again, trying to document, trying to talk about this relationship between the visual um, two dimension and the spatial three dimension, the dance. Um, Oscar Schlemmer, for me, again, at the Bauhaus, I wanted to take you back a little bit into this story of how an artist thinks visually between 2D and 3D. What's interesting, of course, is that the Bauhaus was such a significant part of um, the move from Europe into um, Israel um, in the 30s, and there are big areas, and in fact where uh, Noah Eshkel was living too, there was the, the big areas of architecture that's really coming out of the Bauhaus. So a lot of people came from the Bauhaus, this very extraordinary sense of community a community of creative talents, intelligence, a real collaboration of different people working in different disciplines. And we also know that Noah Ashkel grew up on a kibbutz. So that, that sense of community, that sense of communality, of trying to um, use the arts as a way to articulate this feeling for community, uh, for me, in a funny way, the Bauhaus actually represented that as well. Because in Weimar, Germany, uh, where it starts out, um, there was really the sense of artists coming together to live together, to build together, to conceive of work together, and again, artists from a lot of different disciplines. So meet Oskar Schlemmer, and what's interesting here is that he again is a visual artist, but is also a dancer. So this is again, we're constantly going back and forth, what is that relationship? He made his own emblems here, we're looking at this sign of what he called this intellectual side of his, his brain, and then of course the theater, the, 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 the mask, of theater. Um, he called Apollo the, the god of intellect. That for him was his, his 
his mind as a painter. He felt that was the more intellectual side of his life. Dionysus for him was the god of, of theater, of playfulness, of again, this cross, this back and forth between how do we move in these two dimensions. Uh, so that's Schlemmer in a famous um, ballet that he created called the Triadic Ballet. And again, where I'm taking you to here is this idea of how artists and how Noah Eshkol was thinking too about this relation, this very cerebral relationship about how do we document the body in space? How do we actually notate how we move in space? So there's Schlemmer endlessly talking about his relationship to um, his own body, to st the student body, um, how to transmit this idea of the body in space, um, both as a dancer and as a painter. Um, and in fact, he was also, this is, uh, these are drawings from uh, the Triadic Ballet. Obviously, this is all part of the Bauhaus discussion about the, the triad. Triad is both in terms of color, it's in terms of discipline, it's in terms of three-dimensionality. There's all these wonderful arguments going over, you know, around the breakfast table and around the lunch table at the Bauhaus about the, diff the relationship of color to line to plane and so on. Those of you who know Kandinsky, of course, know um, part of those conversations. Paul Clay, this real endless argument that went on at the Bauhaus, um, they say in this very uh, community-oriented and very high-powered and, of course, very competitive group of, of artists as well, but certainly ones that were really intellectually involved with unraveling what art meant to be an artist in the 20s. Um, so again, we're looking at some of Schlemmer's drawings where he's thinking through this idea of the body as a drawing, the body as a spatial entity. And again, for me, he's a, a wonderful example of how um, you can look at his drawings and actually move with him step by step from a 2D rendering of the body in space um, to this, what he called the stereometry of space. And this is a wonderful drawing for anyone, any of the dancers in the room, because Schlemmer talked about this as a way of feeling your body in space. Space. He said, imagine if you're a dancer um, and that you're in a room filled with sand. I mean, imagine this room right now filled with sand and anybody who's blinking or coughed, all the sand shifts. So it's the sense of how do you get somebody to have that kind of, that level of awareness of the body in space. Um, so that, again, this is the way that Schlemmer was uh, teaching the students. He also ran a, a drawing workshop at the Bauhaus um, precisely to convey these ideas to artists working in dance. Um, and in drawing and in sculpture in whatever field they were in because he felt that the theater this, this, this was the sort of beating heart of the Bauhaus and was a really terrific way to convey um, how to proceed no matter the medium that you were working in. So uh, just to run you through some of Schlemmer's um, references of this inventiveness. And I was intrigued um, early today looking at the Eshkol movements. Um, I imagine that uh, Schlemmer's movements would have also have to be very stylized, very systematic in the way the dancers move in, in the pieces downstairs. Uh, because he created these fantastic costumes. Uh, this one, um, as you can see, then this one was called part of the metal dance. He did another extraordinary project with glass. So this entire costume is made of glass. And again, it's both about the visual. Of course, he was absolutely intrigued by creating objects that you've never seen before, but also providing new kinds of movement. How do you actually move inside a glass costume? Um, and again, this very cerebral breakdown of space, of how we actually move in space, something called the slat dance, um, which is something that Schlemmer, again, was uh, playing with at, at a lot of different levels. And so we move over to Noah Eshkol's own drawings, and of course I'm looking at them in, in those beautiful um, exhibition space downstairs, and I'm seeing this conversation that she was very clearly part of. She works with Laban, uh, who was Rudolf Laban, who created an entire um, notation program. She worked with him for several years in London. She went to a school in London. This was part of a very, uh, a part of an extensive conversation coming out of Germany in the 20s, coming out of Switzerland, where a lot of people went during the, the First World War to escape the war going on, tried to find a neutral place in England. There was this conversation about the body, the sense of the healthy body, the body of the dancer, the body of the of exercise, of Lab and of Mary Vigman and so on. And um, notation was actually very much part of that. And it's a very different kind of notation, because of course if we're talking here about the history of ballet, there's notation that goes back 500, you know, five centuries at least of ways in which people were trying to transcribe specific movements. But when we move into the art world, you're really looking at, again, movement in space rather than sort of how you move feet around um, on a, on a two-dimensional surface. So um, 
for me, when I look at Noah Eshkol's drawings and her, the beginnings of her notation system, also interestingly enough, worked out with an architect. I mean, Wachman was an architect, which again, as I think all these things, pieces uh, come together in a very interesting way because it's something that architects have to think about, is how do we move through space? How do we put bodies in space? Um, so it's not a surprise to me that she found an architect to help her translate these ideas of, of the body and the mechanisms of the body. She talks about the joints and all the ways in which these circular move that you can see how she constructed this um, was really to show um, was a kind of architecture of the body and there, there's a science to it in that sense so that these mechanisms given that an architect was making the drawings for her you can be sure that those mechanisms would, were sound I mean engineering you know they, they were engineered properly to show how the body actually fits together and works so again there's enormous kind of architectural um, underpinning to her drawings which again takes me back to this Bauhaus conversation that even though I never had the chance to meet her or interview her, um, I have a feeling that she knew a lot about those conversations because um, it was so profoundly part of the conversation coming out of the Bauhaus, coming out of the architecture schools, um, and coming out of this interest of the body as a very reduced way, not to have, less having to do with dance than, again, this more cerebral intellectual approach to the movement of the body in space. And so just a few more references because there is a huge, uh, a very beautiful, um, you know, archive of all kinds of notation by visual artists. These are um, Noah and Noah's movement notation. Um, and of course, these beautiful photographs that Sharon Lockhart took of the, the spheres that they made together to actually illustrate, again, this three-dimensionality of the figure in space, which again looks very much to me like a schlammer. Um, and this wonderful way that Sharon Lockhart entered this material, and something that um, Simon and I will talk about a bit later, about the fact that Lockhart essentially comes in and documents or really uses this material as her material. So it's almost like she, as the artist, finds and discovers Noah Eshkol and returns Eshkol to us or gives Eshkol to us in an entirely new way. Um, this is not how Eshkol's work would have been seen or looked at, and yet it's, it kind of elevates an aesthetic and brings in the way that only a visual artist can give to this material um, a, a level of thinking and of, of an aesthetic and a sensibility. So we're actually looking at a, a beautiful, beautiful photograph by Sharon Lockhart of um, a sphere that was made by Noah Eshkol that was not intended as an object, as an art object at all. So these are those edges between these different ways of viewing the world that we're looking at, the art world and, let's say, a, a dance uh, concept. So just wanted to remind you again just some of the, um, the different proposals. This is, of course, the Laban movement that um, anybody who knows about notation uh, would follow. Um, I wanted to show you there was some early John Cage we're looking at here, um, Merce Cunningham. So the dancer always trying to find ways to document, to write about. And again, not I don't ever see this this writing as just merely being about, oh, we, we need to find ways to pass it on to the future. I think it's also about the way a dancer thinks. They're trying to think it through um, two-dimensionally. There's, there's a recording system, a notation, that is coming from the individual, from the personal, and it's as personal as any handwriting. It's not not about finding a universal system. I mean, in a sense, Laban was trying to do that, to say this is a notation system that anybody could read the way you read you know, music notes. Um, it's still much more difficult to earn that because, of course, the body is not its not a set of keys on a piano. The body is doing all kinds of other things, and it's very difficult to capture somebody's persona in there, their whole physical characteristics in, in notation. Um, and right into the 70s, I wrote an article, actually, I rediscovered in 76 when I... Um, on the art of notation that I was looking at, um, Laura Dean, who worked also with Steve Reich, the musician, coming up with her own system about her pattern dances that she was, circle dance that she was using, an entire counting system. Uh, Trisha Brown, another wonderful artist as part of the, the New York scene in the 70s, uh, developing an entire notation system of her own to really describe how um, she moved her artists through different patterns and uh, really using a 
an, a notation system that would actually determine the movements of, of her dancers. Um, and equally, somebody like Lucinda Childs, maybe some of you saw Robert Wilson's uh, recent Einstein on the Beach. Uh, there was a Lucinda Childs piece in there. And uh, so surprisingly, uh, you're not necessarily aware, but so many of the contemporary dancers that we think of you know, from the 70s onwards um, do all have extensive notation styles that, um, and patterns and signatures that they've each been using um, as much to devise the works, uh, to set up a kind of um, you know, a plan for the work as it is uh, something to refer to later on. And, you know, which did bring me to this idea of, you know, what an extraordinary project, Sharon, what, what a, there's it, so many levels at which to talk about it. In a sense, she's given us back Noah Ashkel. She, she discovered Noah Ashkel through her own thinking about how she uses the body, how she could take a film and really think this through, um, how she then presents her own version. So all these questions about documentation, about uh, preservation, about you know what is the of the uh, the dance world doing in the art world, uh, these are all here for us to see in these very beautiful films that Sharon Lockett made. Um, and then how she incorporates the drawings uh, and and the. Um, the carpets that were made and presents them to us in a way that apparently no Ashkel never did. She never included those carpets as kind of sculptural backdrops or stage sets for her dance. So we're looking at so many tears here by this point. So by the time we meet Noah Ashkel's work, it's been exquisitely articulated for us by Sharon Lacroix. And uh, Again, I think this it shows you so much the aesthetic that Sharon Lockhart brings to these films that is entirely her own, and yet that is entirely, the two, the two are completely in harmony in that sense. They're really in cahoots here about how this, this piece comes to be because Noah Eshkol is the centerpiece of it as well. Thank you, and then it's up to you, Simon. I need the clicker. Can you hear me? Yeah. So I'm not behind a podium, but I'm behind a laptop. But it's just to make sure that I cover all the ground that I want to cover. So um, there's a blank. OK, firstly, I need to apologize for this rather arch title, not a notation. I was, uh, it's a bit sort of early 20, 21st century, I know, but I, I was, um, I, I couldn't resist the idea that notation also includes the idea of notion as well as its own negative. And for me, a notation really, as, as Rosalie has talked about, is something that is very personal. It's not, it's not a scientific objective process. It's a notion of how you can look at movement. So let's Let's move on. Um, the Movement Notation was published in 1958. That was really the result of a long process of her thinking and working with, and it's interesting that uh, Avraham Wachman is always referred to as an architect, but actually he was also a dancer first. Um, I think there's a sort of hierarchy of professions going on here, but as someone from the dance world, I like to think of him as a dancer who was also an architect. But that's how they met. They met in a studio, uh, and that's how they started to work on this whole process of looking at how can we do what Rosalie has, has eloquently described, this notion of how do we describe this strange thing of moving the body in space, which you know is as tangible as it is intangible, that disappears the moment you make it. And I think their attempt was really uh, not to create this literal description, which I know, uh, I, I think Noah Eshka was very critical of Laban notation, feeling it was a very literal, descriptive uh, process. And her interest really was, I think, inspired initially by looking at musical scores and being aware that on paper you could produce something that would render this incredibly complex and subtle thing called music. Uh, so she was looking at how, how can we do that in a similar way for this thing that was clearly critical to her way of being and her way of... Uh, uh, living, which was uh, movement and mov moving, uh, and her her quote here, really from the newspaper, um, she's looking at not this, not the a sequence of actions, a sort of uh, 
stop motion idea, stop frame idea, but something that is the result or the cause of those actions, the movement itself. She was looking for something, a way of recording what is actually very elusive. Uh, Talia is in the, uh, the, the, the gorgeous catalogue for the exhibition, which I, I recommend, uh, um, although there are many things in it I disagree with, but uh, the interesting thing here, Talia talks about Noah's real quest, looking for this idea of a precision and a purity of movement. Uh, again, something that I think is incredibly subjective. It's uh, your own notion of what is you know, what is pure movement? How can you, how can you disentangle movement from uh, its its intention or or the result of it? But that's what she was looking for, and it's an incredibly um, principled look at how you could analyze movement from this idea. I think the looking at the spheres, the the spheres uh, models that uh, Sharon has photographed, is a great way of. of Understanding this idea that you know limbs are linked to joints, and every movement from a, a fixed point is circular, and and the body, of course, describes a circle. It's its core core being the axis, and any movement is part of dis describing what could be a, a sphere. So that was really her a principled way of looking at it. It's illustrated here by uh, John Harris, who was one of her group, looking at this whole notion of the body as a kind of fluid movement. And those spirals, of course, can going both ways. Oh, sorry, that's, uh, that's the wrong slide. But, um, but perhaps those of you who are not so interested could follow the instruction if you, if you wish to. Um, so what is what is Noah really looking at here? And I think uh, it's it's in a sense a way. Uh, it's, she's really looking at a system, uh, her own system. Again, Rosalie talked about this idea that it's not a mechanism purely to describe what's happening, but it's also a system to aid her own understanding of movement, uh, a methodology, if you like, that enables you to apply a certain kind of thinking about the body and using it as a way of literally thinking about how how movement is composed and how you could sequence different elements of movement together in order to create the kind of compositions that she did. I think it's it's significant that she refers to herself as a composer of movement as opposed to a choreographer. Uh, and her interest really was in looking at this constant dynamic fluid relationships between movement. Very similar, I mean I was struck by how similar that is to the way Merce Cunningham works. Um, I don't know if, if any of you were at the Joyce Theatre a couple of years ago. Um, Cédric Andria, who was a, a long-time Cunningham dancer, um, was in a piece by Jérôme Bell in which he really describes working with Merce. And Merce would take you know, a certain movement and then relate it to the left arm, the right arm, the left leg, the right leg. Only he would really methodically work through sequences of movement to look at what every possibility was with the human body. Um, and as he says, the only way really was to explore it. I think for the dancer, it was incredibly uh, mind-numbing. Cedric talked about spending hours looking out of the studio window at the activity of New York passing as he was taking you know, this, this instruction from Merce as Merce explored this process. But there was a very close proximity with the way in which they would really explore every possibility of the, the biomechanics of movement. And I, I think this really explains the, the, the bigger issue here, that uh, Noah was really not so interested in making dances. She wasn't uh, creating choreography. She was really interested in this idea of how you can find the, 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 the most powerful expression of this thing that we all have, which is the human body. And I think that's driven by I, I'm an ideological concern. I mean, I don't think we can separate it from the, you know, the emergence of Israel, the the kind of ideology, the utopianism that was part of that whole con uh, the time she was in. But it's again striking in the in its connection to the way in which um, 
Judson Church, uh, Yvonne Reiner's No Manifesto was rejecting theatricality, rejecting decoration as part of dance, and that there's a real synchronicity of looking at the essence of what the body could be. But I think those two things really, uh, and, and this is where I, you know, I propose it was a notion, both of those things, in order to do that, you have to choose uh, what to leave out, what to edit, if you like, from this mechanism, from this process. And two of the things that are now very critical to the way artists think about their work and the way in which we look at work are these two uh, elements. Context, which of course is you know, where a piece is happening, who's commissioning it, who is it for, all the things around the kind of notion of what an art piece is being made for, and who's in it, you know, who gets to choose who's in it, who's able to be in it, all of those things determine the way in which we, we look at a piece of work. Oh, sorry, another wrong slide, but faced with a choice to do both, that's kind of interesting. It means, actually quite interestingly, when you have got options, you don't necessarily need to make decisions, perhaps working with both of them gives you something a little more complex to work with. But let's look again at the relationship between context and uh, participants. So we know this is something very familiar, I guess, to, to many of us. Uh, we know that performance can happen by these kinds of people in this kind of context. It can also happen by these kinds of people in this kind of context. Or it can happen in this kind of context too. This, um, I think, points to the ways in which we should be looking to, uh, at the relationship between the frameworks in which a performance happens and how we as audiences, how artists involved in the making of it, construct meaning and construct a relationship between us as an audience and the work itself. Uh, so another wrong slide, but that's kind of interesting in the sense that it shows there are other ways that artists have suggested not perhaps to document a, a, a process or to notate a certain kind of work, but offer us approaches to our own creative practice. And this is um, Brian Eno and Peter Schmidt who proposed a series of oblique strategies in 1975, again documenting a kind of a way of working which is not proposing a certain kind of thing or a certain kind of outcome, but offering you a set of possibilities for the way in which you might conduct your practice. So it flows from their artistic practice, but is not about defining an end result or a product that's entirely up to you. So. What do we need to do when we are looking at work now, then, uh, and, and certainly in terms of relationship between con contemporary artistic practice and uh, what you might call the way in which an audience engages with it? Um, and firstly, of course, is looking at this whole framework of where is it happening and, and who's commissioned it and how has it been funded and who's in it? What are the roles of all these different people? How do we define what we should be as, are we there to look? Are we there to be participating? Are we, are we in a venue where we can sit, as you are doing now, and observe? Is it something where we have to be more mobile? The, the artist and the, the construction around the work needs to very, look very carefully at defining those roles. And as each piece of work e emerges, uh, it needs a, dis a very distinctive or appropriate process for that work to develop. And especially if you're going to engage people uh, very directly uh, as non-professionals in a, in a practice, which is broadly now defined as socially engaged practice, uh, you need to be very specific about understanding as an artist what that process needs and for the participants to be clearly engaged and, and informed and uh, um, uh, able to, to participate. Gardening, not architecture, it's one of my favorite oblique strategies, but again, it looks at different approaches to, to structure. 
So what are the implications for us? Um, I think it's critical that uh, there are ways in which we define and engage with performance. Uh, for me, it's really a, a case of the ways in which an artist frames or determines uh, a project which needs to inherent, be inherently in the project, helping us to look at how we connect with it as an audience. Um, the multiplicity of needs of a project can require a whole set of different forms and mediums and that can bring uh, this notion of uh, transdisciplinarity or, or multiple art forms together in one piece of work. Again, setting up a, a different relationship between how you engage with it and how you read it, what, what an audience brings in terms of their openness and, what, uh, and how, how an artist is able to convey that work. Yeah, perhaps, perhaps I need to reverse this one and uh, be less ambiguous and, and speak more specifically. But um, I think for those of us involved in education, uh, it also raises a number of questions now about, uh, and this is the project I, I was really involved in in Arizona for the last five years, how do we train artists to essentially have the, the, new, the sets of skills, the understandings and the awarenesses that start to bring, they need to bring to bear on, in working in a, in a much more broadly defined way. And it also, for those of us producing work uh, and supporting the presentation of work, how do we change our structures in order to best uh, present the work? How do we find the optimum platform to present the work? This is one probably more for you than for me, but I, I take it uh, very uh, literally sometimes. Um, it also questions the, the role, the, you know, the, the very bricks and mortar and the concrete structures that we've built to support the arts. Are they the most appropriate any longer for the ways in which artists are now working and the ways in which communities want to engage with the arts? It starts to question a lot of the, current, the infrastructure that we have spent literally hundreds of years building and the way in which money is, dis is distributed and the ways in which projects are supported, often the, the frameworks that are set up to support artistic practice no longer fit the ways in which artists are working. So there becomes a, a need for change uh, on all these different levels. And of course, going back to the idea of notation, uh, if you're thinking of a piece of work uh, that involves you know, a, num a specific, you know, multi-generational community over a period of time, what is it you really are notating? Is it, is it the end result? Is it their experience? Is it the process? It raises all those kind of questions about how now we can look at this idea of notation and recording. So let me just briefly touch on uh, a few strategies that artists uh, have, have recently developed to help convey an artistic idea, but which doesn't predetermine necessarily a very specific product or an output. Thomas Lehmann is an artist based in Berlin who um, produced this piece called Schreibstück, a written piece in German in 2002. He's very interested in essentially um, public uh, uh, or, or human functions, the, you know, the way in which we behave, the way in which we do things, the kind of movement, the physicality we do in our everyday lives, you know, eating, shopping, working, how that en engages the body. And he's very interested in cultural difference. How, how do different people uh, undertake that? How do we perceive people based on how they're moving? So this piece is actually uh, a very uh, simple uh, idea. Um, there's a score, I, it's probably a bit small for you to see, but the, the piece is built around the idea of three groups um, work on this score. It's, it's divided into three sections. The, the top, oh there's a, there's a little button, ah yes, the top, this is the first one, the second and the third. Uh, each of these lines is what each of the performers is doing. And, and the bars represent a minute. So in other words, the first section is 13 minutes long. There's a minute pause and then another 13 and a minute pause. However, it's done in canon. So the first group of three people come on the stage and they, they do these three things. And the audience know exactly what they're doing because you have this in your, in your hand. And while they begin part two, 
group two comes on and does part one in the same space. So you're looking exactly at what the first group have done in relationship to what the second group have done. And this becomes, of course, interesting if you have um, groups who are from different uh, contexts or from different countries uh, exploring this material. Um, in Vancouver, there was a version that brought together uh, three people from Vancouver, three people from New York, and three people from uh, Central Europe. And so they presented it in Canon. Last year, uh, in, in Arizona, we made a production across the whole Institute for Design and the Arts, uh, which included people from art, architecture, music, dance, theater. Um, and we had a group of faculty, a group of graduate students, master students, and a group of undergraduate students. So they all worked on the same material, then presented it in canon. Uh, this, is the, this is a music professor, this is the chair of architecture, and this is the director of uh, theater and film. So they were all involved in exploring the, exactly the same material. So the, the piece very clearly delineates the differences between these perspectives. But of course, the framework is set up by the score by, by Thomas Lehman. Uh, Jérôme Bell, the show must go on was premiered in Paris. He's based in Paris. He's more, f he's kind of familiar now in New York. Um, he's interested in the very act, if you like, the what it is to go to the theatre. Why, why, as you are doing now, why we go to these strange places and sit in the dark for hours on end and watch these things happening on a stage. He's interested in what that is, why we do that, what that phenomenon is. But he's also interested in how that connects to the, the cultural lives we all have outside the theatre, the kind of popular culture that invades that. So The Show Must Go On was a, a piece that was built around a dramaturgy of popular music songs and the title of the song or the theme of the song was essentially the very uh, material that the performers worked with. So he had uh, a number of performers, both professionals and non-professionals, um, and uh, they literally performed. So one song, for instance, I like to move it, move it, meant they all moved a different part of their body or a bit of the stage. It was very literal rendition of that. But he created this framework in which the movement was created by the performers themselves and related to their own notions in relationship to these songs. And he made versions in, uh, in Germany with a, a repertory theater company. He's made a version in Brazil. Uh, he's made a version in Philadelphia. And then in October, two, two months ago, he made a version here in New York that was shown at the, at the Museum of Modern Art. Um, again, working with uh, performers and curators and people he, he knew. So in other words, again, he has a structure uh, which is repeatable, but and he directs it. It's different to Thomas Lehman, who sends the score and you don't see him until the, the first night. Um, but it's a structure which enables the same material to be explored but in different ways based on who is cast in the piece. Um, and the last thing I'd like to show is uh, Rosemary Lee. You saw an image of this before. She's based in London. She works over immense lengths of time, usually with um, very intensely with communities, often two or three generations within a community. This piece, Square Dancers, was in London last year. She worked with three of these inner London squares that are often fenced off and you never quite know what's going on there. But she worked with the people who live around them, three of them, their stories, their bodies, the way they wanted to express their uh, ideas, and created this performance piece that was very much made by them, about them, and about these places. So very time-specific, very person-specific, very site-specific. And um, of course, one wonders what then is, is the, is the piece, is the piece what the audience go and see at the very end, what's the experience for the performers, how do you really deal with that? So the, these for me are the, the big uh, shifts in the way we're thinking about work, where the relationship between where you're playing and what you're playing uh, becomes very uh, integral to the, the notion of what the work is. Um, 
intention is technique. By that, I mean there's a, a different sense of skill base here where the idea that you have in terms of who you want to involve and how you want to work really is a di display of the kind of skill base that, that you have. It's a different sense of what performance uh, and uh, skill is and where experience really that for everyone involved, not just the participants, but the, the audience too, and the, the artistic uh, process becomes very much the, the, the kind of key part of the work. Um, I will, so thank you. So we're in conversation. Yeah, for a couple of hours. No, just a little one. Um, if you saw Noah Eshkol performing here right now, what would you be thinking? I mean, we've seen it. I was just trying to get a nice slide, but I... Uh, okay. Oh, yeah, there's Noah. Well, I, I was thinking more of her performers. I mean, it's, uh, most of the reading about her is that she wasn't really thinking of performing so much. Isn't that on? Oh. Technical support. Pardon? <laughs> Thank you. Now, what what um, what struck me so much about uh, reading and, and seeing Sharon's films uh, was that Noah was really not so interested in making performances. Um, I think the, the notion that she called her group the chamber dance group was that she was always seeing this as something that was small scale, it was very intimate, and it seemed to be far more about the daily practice of exploring this movement possibility, what that meant uh, for someone who was moving, you know, how, how you could apply this sort of methodology to your own body and what that meant in, in relationship to what she was seeing uh, in, in, from the outside of these bodies moving in space. So it seemed to be a very um, uh, kind of closed, almost uh, um, a kind of personal journey, a personal, uh, uh, very, um, I don't think obsessive is necessarily the word, but it was clearly part of a very clear practice that was about finding a relationship between movement and the body that was kind of crucial for, for the way in which she saw her relationship to the, the larger world. And I, you know, I, th I think the context of the emerging state of Israel and the, the kind of celebration of the, the, you know, the healthy, fit body was something that informed it, but she was driven by something that was very much a kind of personal research about really defining what this thing was uh, called a human movement. Um, Aviva, are you here? Yes. In terms of uh, this exhibition, did you know about Noah's work before? Did Sharon introduce you to that? So what did you discover? I mean, as, as, the, as one of the curators, how did you? Now it seemed a perfect fit for them. Do you have any questions? Well, my question was was more to you. I, I mean, I, I think the the parallels between you know what was happening in the Bauhaus and what was happening uh, in 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 Israel at the, at the time were and and I mean my my thought of it connecting to Judson Church ideas of minimalism and this kind of reduction of theatricality down to something more essential clearly was part of a, a bigger, I mean you could say there was a zeitgeist uh, mm -hmm. that, it, that created that, th those parallels, but my sense is it was um, informed or it was driven by very different uh, ideas or ideologies. I just wonder from your point of view if you felt there was a, 
there's really a direct correlation between Bauhaus thinking and what was happening in Israel because of the, the migration of, of people? Or was it something that uh, really was driven by a different set of sensibilities? Well, I think there's a, there is a lot of crossover. I mean, it's a period of time when there was enormous utopian I ideals. I think what drove um, many of the issues going on, I mean, with the way the Israeli kibbutz and so on, and, and mm. even the architecture that they embraced, that they did bring, that a lot of the Bauhaus people came in those buildings, there's big parts of Tel Aviv that are maybe the biggest, the most extensive Bauhaus buildings that exist, mm. uh, were all built. And what they were, just going back to an aesthetic, they were very minimal. They were talking about, um, there, was a, a fest there was a big festival at the Bauhaus in 1923 called Art and Technology, the New Unity. And I say there's this moment too, which is why I always find that um, the, the Shrier drawing so interesting because there was this moment where they, they kicked out all the artists from the earlier generation who were expressionistic and said, you know, phew, out you go. We're tired of this. We want something very clean, very minimal, um, this new art and technology. So if you think of the furnishings, you think of all the, all the, the uh, physical objects that came out of the Bauhaus, they were very, very minimal. And mm. so to translate that, add that to the interest in the body, the whole corporate, um, you know, the, the, uh, the mission of a lot of the dance people of that time to minimalize the dance movement. I mean, there's some films from that period that just looks like a Simone Forti or something. It's ridiculous. They're mm. so close. Um, just stripping everything, trying to do very, very simple body movement. Um, so again, that's, I think there are a lot of correlations. I mean, it's, it's maybe, again, the, 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 probably the history of how come all those architects from the Bauhaus came to Israel and how that work actually took root. Um, is very critical to what I think she was looking at. Mm. Um, but um, so there's this, and I think in those days too, I think it's something we all miss now. I think the conversation between artists and artists from a lot of disciplines and a conversation that was ongoing. I mean, to me, again, that's where I see a kind of Bauhaus uh, ethos in terms of people really getting so much out of being together and having these conversations mm. and the kind of conversation mixed with the politics of, of what was going on in Israel. I mean, she apparently starts the, the carpets in 19, you know, during the, the first um, six-day war and, and how those projects somehow grow out of a lot of the turmoil and the sense of, uh, also the sense of heroism that was, everybody was feeling sure. during that war and the Yom Kippur war, this ability to do anything and everything that you could be so adventurous and forward thinking. Um, I think, you know, to me, looking at Israeli artists then and Israeli artists now, there's always this extraordinary uh, daring, in a way, um, to take on new issues that I think just drives a lot of the intellectual and creative life there. Mm. So I see that as being very much about that period as well. But we have some people from, yeah. Yeah. No, are there... Are there Questions in the audience? It's hard to see you, so you need to uh, shout a little. Yes. Yeah. Um, one of the hallmarks of uh, the uh, avant garde movements in the early 20th century, when you mentioned Bauhaus, but constructivists as well, uh, was always this multidisciplinarity, investigating um, questions, subjects through a wide variety of, of fields or mediums, whether it was architecture, topography visual art, etc. So now, um, because you talk of zeitgeist, there's this enormous um, resurgence of an interest in, uh, in dance within the context of visual arts. And you go from a modern to um, the medium of modern art, Jerome Bell is here and there, and uh, a lot of um, choreographers are, are being presented again. And I wonder um, if that has anything to do at all with uh, what we saw at the beginning of the 20th century, or what are the impulses behind this renewed interest and bringing dance into uh, the sphere of visual arts, and particularly uh, museums? Um, I think it's a very different time. I think it's interesting that the people bringing that material into the museum is coming from the, the curatorial dimension, and it wasn't actually coming so much, apart from a very few artists. Um, I mean, you know, of course, Tino, who you were involved with so closely, Jerome, the, the relationship with the artists has been sort of a very small part of their drive. 
And I see what, and yet it was obviously very, you know, it started to grow around, you know, how Tino moves into the art world, how that comes really out of a dance project, but then how that reaches back, going into art history and dance history here into the 70s and post uh, Yvonne Rayner. But I do find the current movement of the dance world into the museum world is, has not been coming from the dancers themselves. Uh, so I think that's a very big difference. I think the, those periods we're talking about, those uh, both in the 20s and in the 60s and 70s, the dance and, and uh, art communities were literally in bed with each other. I mean, they were all they were together in a very in very complex and exciting ways. And you know, the Steve Wright and the Phil Glass and the, the filmmakers and the musicians and you know, the lives were being lived very in, in very close tandem. Whereas I would say at the moment that ha that is not the case, and there's a different criteria of why this work is entering the museum. Um, so I, I just think it's coming from a different place, and I think the the, the dancers, in a way, are as, as surprised as anyone as to this sudden, <laughs> you know invitation into the art world, um, and some are refusing it. I mean, I think Jerome Bell was talking about you know somebody wanted to sell one of his projects in the gallery for a lot of money, and he actually said, no, I, I'm, in the, I'm in, the art, in the dance world, I'm not in the art world. So I think uh, where it crosses over into the marketplace has also become a very interesting part of the discussion. And it's a long conversation here, Jens. It's a great question. And, um, but but my sense is it's, it's, uh, yeah, it, it is driven by arts curators. I, I mean, if you look at the kind of evolution of contemporary dance practice and uh, contemporary art, there's, there's a kind of time lag. You know, modern dance really is a mid-war, but it's, it's, a, it's really a mid-20th century phenomenon, and it's spent a lot of time defining itself and exploring itself. And in the process of doing that, actually, you know, lost, lost a lot of attention and a lot of audience as it really tried to uh, free itself up from, you know, notions of classicism or notions of kind of folk practice and define what it was. And I think now there's a, there's a whole range of artists who are working in, in very interesting ways and there are very close parallels to the way a lot of visual artists are working. So curators are saying, ah, that idea is reflected here. <laughs> I think there's, in other words, there's a kind of catching up now that w that dance actually is something that is dealing with, you know, ideas and with substance, um, and 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 visual arts curators are finding that's appealing because, of course, having a live body in a museum is something that's very visceral and very kind of uh, uh, powerful for an audience to engage with instead of seeing a, you know, a kind of a, dead or flat or static object. So it's something that's, in a sense, connected, I think, intellectually and, uh, and aesthetically with their kind of interests, but of course it also has a very tangible appeal to museum goers. I mean, just seeing the, the number of people who would line up at, at the Museum of Modern Art, you know, not just to visit Marina during, you know, the artist is present, but during this last uh, Ralph Lemon series, it, it was it was phenomenal. In, in a way, it was a very quiet part of the Museum of Modern Arts program, but there was a lot of attention because it's very uh, it's very powerful and very visceral. And you know, those who are dancers and those who at, attend dance performances know what that impact is like. But I think for museum attend attendees, it's it's a kind of new and exciting phenomenon. Uh, I mean, the issue I think is how do museums really um, if this is something they want to do, how do they really curate that in a way that is evolving and developmental for the art form as opposed to just you know, cherry picking from uh, things that are already out there. And I, I think well, that's, that's when it starts to get interesting, when there can be a real dialogue as opposed to a sort of, um, a we'll have one of those and two of those. Yeah, I think that's definitely been one of the problems. I think for those of us who go to dance and uh, both have a foot in both worlds, it was a little bit like bringing the mountain to Muhammad. You know, we've seen all that work; <laughs> it's out there, and it's actually making it easier for the dance, for the the art world, to see the dance because yeah. uh, we've all been, we all know about Sarah Mitchelson. If we've been going to dance for the last you know fifteen or so years, we know all these artists. But to bring it into a new context has been very interesting. Yeah. 
but and does it's coming in at a very different way. Yeah, I think I think for dancers uh, and choreographers, you know, it's business as usual. They're used to working in all kinds of spaces. You know, the the economy of dance has meant that people have become incredibly adaptable and flexible, and have actually embraced the possibility of working in different kinds of spaces other than just very you know expensive proscenium theatres. So for them, it's business as usual. It's a different kind of audience, and I know talking to a lot of the choreographers who presented work at the Museum of Modern Art, it's it's actually a very um, disappointing experience because people's uh, attention span and their notion of what I'm visiting, you know, they will be there at the beginning and after a few minutes wander off when actually, you know, you need to give this time. It's a time-based practice. Uh, and when you go to a museum, you, you're not used to sitting in front of something for 30, 40, 50 minutes. It's not something you do. So the culture of museum going and the culture of time-based performance practice is something that I think has to uh, really uh, dialogue with each other a little more be before it starts to become useful and valuable for both. There's also perhaps other overlaps in regards to specific group of choreographers that are working right now. And Jerome Bell is at least definitely one of them, both Shamans is someone else, uh, Xavier Leroy, and um, I would also put Tino Segal into this category, even though his work has mostly been seen in the visual arts. So a group of artists who sort of emerged in the mid-90s, late-90s, who looked at dance and choreography extremely conceptual, almost in a similar manner as artists in the visual art world were looking at the visual arts in the late 60s and 70s, really radically questioning what is the nature of this particular art form, mm. and, and almost dissolving it. Um, I mean, the interesting thing that with the show must go on that you presented, the reason for the title was that Jerome went into retirement after he got too much um, attention and, and called his performance before uh, the final spectacle, and then re-emerging a year after, after taking a sabbatical with, uh, with the, uh, the show must go on. Mm -hmm. So really conceptually playing also with how you develop your career and thinking about um, um, connections between different artworks, not unlike visual artists. Sure. But it's interesting too, the time lab, because Jens, you and I have known those artists and that work and been following it since its inception in the 90s. And in fact, we showed all of that at Perform in 2007, so it's been a time lag of actually five, you know, seven to 12 um, years for that to actually enter the museum. But all those artists were shown, you know, have been shown in New York before, but the art world was not paying attention in that quite that same way. So it, it's interesting what how these different time lags, how that has suddenly become interesting. Whereas, you know, all those people were part of Performa in 07. I, Jerome Bell was here. I mean, Xavier was here a couple of years before that at the kitchen. But again, the art world wasn't looking then. So it's, it's what, <laughs> what has shifted. And I think that's an interesting place where, we're all tr but I, where but we also need to catch them up with the history because that history is not very well known. Yeah, but I think you're right. The, the I mean, what the notion of conceptual practice in dance, you know, was a term that really has come from the visual art world. A lot of the choreographers we're talking about, Boris and Thomas uh, and Jerome, can, rejected that word. You know, they, they were saying, our, you know, our work and the work of people before us has always been about ideas. It's not that you're just moving for the sake of it. You know, dance comes from a set of ideas and a set of uh, intentions. But, but you're right, the kind of thematic material became more overtly present in the work and became more readable to a visual art world. And I think that's the issue. You're right, there's a time lag, and the, you're right, there was this... Um, evolution of, of practice that paralleled what had happened in visual art. But I think it comes from a, um, a set of ideas about looking at the nature of performance. It's what I was trying to talk about. And you can't disentangle the body from the frameworks that inform the way in which you know the body exists in time, in space, in a, in a social structure, in a, in a economic framework, all of those things. And those artists were working with that, which yeah, had very strong resonances with uh, visual arts curators and with the museums. And so suddenly they become people we can read and engage with in a way that we found it rather difficult before. Thank you. Oh no. We all have to take a break.
introduce you. We just started. We just started.